Good morning, everybody. So we have five panelists with us this, this morning to answer your questions about the 2020 election. And before I introduce our panelists, I have a few tips for communicating with us during the webinar. Your microphone and webcam are not needed and will not be used during the webinar. All attendees' microphones have been muted. If you have a question during the webinar, on your Zoom toolbar, you can click or tap the Q&A icon at, and type in your question. And though, even though you will see a chat icon, that function is turned off today. So use the Q&A for any questions. If those are questions for the panelists or questions because you're having uh, trouble hearing or seeing the presentation. The webinar is being recorded. I just started it and will be closed captioned and available at the webinar resources page later today. You have a couple of options for adjusting your screen. You can exit full screen if you want to see uh, the uh, operating systems toolbar. You can, whoops. You can also rearrange your screen. So when we're doing screen sharing, you can have the uh, presenters' faces on the right side or at the top. That's my alarm to start the, the webinar. Uh, let's see, and um, uh, you can resize the shared screen. You can kind of uh, just move it back and forth to resize it. So that's it for the housekeeping. And I will start another slide deck. Here we go. So our panelists today are Amy Peterson. She's director of the Lena Public Library and also clerk for the town of Little River. Eileen Newcomer is the voter education manager with the Wisconsin League of Women Voters. Chrissy Wick is assistant director for the Madison Public Library. And Richard is with us. He is the assistant administrator of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, but Megan is not available to be with us today. So we have four fabulous panelists. So the agenda for the webinar today is each panelist will take a turn to share their experiences and their information. And thank you for having submitted questions when you registered because that helped our panelists realize, okay, this I will, you know, I can cover this question during my presentation. And following their presentations, there will be kind of a free form time where they can answer any remaining questions including the ones that you submitted ahead of time, plus any questions you submit during the webinar. And we can stay online through 1030 this morning, just to make sure we get all your questions answered. So our first presenter this morning is Eileen Newcomer. She is the Voter Education Manager for the League of Wisconsin, League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. And I'm going to, uh, I have her slide deck incorporated into mine. So if you want to unmute Eileen and let me know when I should advance a slide, that would be cool. I will do so. Thank you so much, Joy, for the welcome uh, to speaking with everybody. I'm really happy to be here and be part of the panel. Um, as Joy said, I am Eileen Newcomer and I'm the Voter Education Manager for the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. Um, my role in today's training will be to give a quick overview of the voting process um, to help ground us all in the same information during today's webinar. But first, I wanted to give a little bit more information about the League of Women Voters. Um, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization of women and men committed to making voting free, fair, and accessible to all. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. We know democracy is better when more people are involved and when our representatives reflect and are responsive to the communities they serve. We're staunchly nonpartisan, meaning we don't support or oppose a candidate or party. And as you can see on the map, uh, we have 20 local leagues around the state, and they would be great partners for you as you make plans to engage voters in the future. Next slide, please. Um, the November 3rd election is going to be here sooner than we think. And in addition to voting for president and vice president, voters will choose representatives to Congress, state senators, state assembly representatives, and make choices on local candidates and referendas as well. 
Um, here in Wisconsin, we have three ways to vote. Absentee by mail, in-person absentee, otherwise known as early voting. And I just want to make a note that hours and location vary um, from municipality to municipality. So that's something you have to do a little bit of digging to find um, for your community. And then on election day, uh, polls are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. And one thing that you can uh, share with the folks is that if you're in line um, to vote at 8 p.m., you can stay in line and you still get to vote. Not everyone knows that. Sometimes people think that once 8 p.m. hits, then the line disperses, but everyone who's in line uh, gets to vote. Um, next slide, please. I uh, wanted to give a little bit more information about voting absentee. Um, you know, due to coronavirus, absentee voting has become an increasingly popular way to vote this year. Um, in Wisconsin, there are no excuses needed to vote absentee. So any registered voter can request an absentee ballot. Um, voting as absentee is easy and convenient for many voters, but it's really important that voters follow all the instructions to ensure their vote is counted. Absentee voters need to have a witness sign and put their address on their return envelope. And witnesses can be any U.S. adult citizen. Uh, we've heard from many voters uh, who had difficulty finding a witness during the April election. And so this might be a service that your library would like to provide um, to help people who don't have a witness other, otherwise. Um, absentee ballots must be delivered no later than 8 p.m. on election day. And the Postal Service recommends voters mail back their absentee ballots at least one week before Election Day, if not sooner, to ensure it arrives in time. Next slide, please. Um, I do want to go over voter eligibility because I want to acknowledge that not everyone is eligible to vote in Wisconsin, um, whether because of their citizenship status, age, felony status, or because of a guardianship decision. So the, you're eligible to vote in Wisconsin if you are a U.S. citizen, um, if you will be at least 18 years old or older on election day, if you resided in Wisconsin for 28 days prior to the election. And I do want to note that this has been a recent change, so this might be new information for some folks. Um, you're also eligible to vote if you're not currently serving a sentence, including incarceration, parole, probation, or extended supervision for a felony conviction. This is known as being um, off paper. And so this is another important thing to know that not everyone is aware of is that here in Wisconsin, once somebody has um, been convicted of a felony, once they've completed their sentence, they, their right to vote is restored to them. And that could, can be helpful information for people to have. Um, and then finally, uh, you need to not, be, not have been determined by court to be ineligible to vote. This comes up most often during guardianship decisions, um, but I want to make sure everyone is aware of that as well. Next slide, please. Um, when you talk to people about voting, one of the first steps that they will need to do is register to vote. And so it's helpful to know, you know, who, who does need to register to vote? It's first time voters. Um, people, if they have moved, they need to re-register. Um, even if you've moved from one apartment unit to another unit inside the same building, you still need to register to vote. That happened to me um, a couple years ago, and I was like, oh, shoot, yeah, okay, I do need to re-register to vote. Um, so that's just something that not everyone knows. Um, you need to re-register to vote if you've changed your name and if you uh, haven't voted in over four years. There are a few different pathways for people to register to vote. Um, one is online at my vote, and I'll hear later in my part of the presentation, I'll give you a quick overview of uh, the resources available on my vote. Um, and you can do that up to 20 days before the election. Note, I have an asterisk here. This has been, had some contention um, with, within the courts leading up to uh, the November election, and so we'll see if it fluctuates a little bit, but as of today, um, the deadline is uh, 20 days before the election. Can, voters can also register by mail to their, uh, by sending it to their municipal clerk, um, in person at their municipal clerk's office, and at their polling place on election day. I really do want to highlight 
the fact that in Wisconsin, we have same day voter registration. So voters can register and vote all on election day. And it's a really important safeguard to make sure that every voter uh, is able to cast their ballot. Next slide, please. Um, so voters are going to register to vote. They need to provide a proof of residence document. Um, it needs to include their name and current address and can be either paper or electronic. Um, on the slide here, I have some a image of some of the common examples of proof of residence document, including a driver's license or state ID card, utility bill, um, a paycheck, different things like that. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's meant to kind of give you an idea of some of the different options that you can help people think through that will serve um, as a proof of residence document for them. Next slide, please. Um, and then here in Wisconsin, we do have a photo ID law. So voters do need to provide a photo ID, um, whether they're going to vote in person um, or if they are going to request an absentee ballot, they need to provide a copy of their photo ID when making their request. Um, there are a few exceptions to this. For example, if voters are indefinitely confined, meaning they're gonna have difficulty making it to the polls due to age, illness, or uh, infirmity or disability, um, those voters can certify that they're indefinitely confined and not provide a photo ID, but for the vast majority of voters, they do need to provide a photo ID. This is the list of options, um, most common ones that people use are driver's licenses and uh, passports, but it is also important to note that uh, many student IDs also uh, work as well, although not every college or university ID is compliant. And then finally, I do want to highlight that current address is not required on a photo ID. So some people think that if their um, address, if their photo ID has an address from a previous residence, they can't use it to vote. That's not true. People um, can use their photo ID to vote even if the address is not current on it. Next slide, please. Um, I like to share this image. I think it's a really great image that was put together by the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Uh, that describes the difference between proof of residence and photo ID. People often get these two things confused. Um, and I think this really clearly lays out the differences between the two. Um, proof of residence is used uh, when you're going to register to vote. Some common documents are utility bill, driver's license or ID, pay stub, bank statement, credit card statement, things like that. And it serves to show um, the voter's name and current address and shows you know where they reside and proves that they reside in the state. Um, photo ID is what people use to after they're registered to get their ballot. Um, people can use a driver's license, passport, veterans ID, military ID. There are a number of other options as we just saw in the previous slide. And like I said, it does not need to include a current address. And so your photo ID shows who you are um, and that you match the, the image on your ID. Next slide, please. So as promised, I just wanted to give a quick overview of um, my vote. It is kind of weird being the person to talk about it with Richard here on the call, but um, I'm sure he has other things that he will be discussing later. Um, so this is the state's uh, voter information tool. It's myvote.wi.gov. And here on this uh, site, voters can find their polling place, see a sample ballot, um, register to vote, vote absentee. Um, now they can track their absentee ballot, which is something that I know is giving a lot of voters um, confidence in the system so that they can see where their ballot is each step of the way. Um, and I really encourage anyone who wants to get more involved in helping voters and increasing uh, people turning out to vote to really get familiar with this website. Um, next slide, please. I also wanted to share a few resources that the League offers as well. One of them is vote411.org. Um, this is our, this is run by the League of Women Voters National and has information on how to register to vote, um, what they call the rules of the road. So it answers a lot of different um, voting questions and has it for um, each state in, in the country. Um, also particularly of note, um, this is where we provide our unbiased candidate information. And so a lot of people don't vote because they don't know who to vote for. We're not here to tell people who they should vote for. 
but do want to provide a resource where they can do their own research and make their own decision. Um, so this could be a resource that you point people to if they're looking for that kind of information. And I'm really happy to say that Vote for One One is now uh, finally fully accessible in English and in Spanish. Um, I also wanted to just quickly talk about the information that we have on our website, lwbwi.org. Um, we have some great voting information on there as well, everything from registering to vote to learning more about the candidates, photo ID, absentee and early voting, and more. Um, and we also have that information available in both English and in Spanish. Next slide, please. And then, uh, Finally, I just wanted to mention um, the Voter Education and Registration Assistance Program. This was an initiative uh, started by the League of Women Voters of the Northwoods, one of our 20 local leagues in the state. And they've had many uh, very fruitful partnerships with libraries um, to make voting information more accessible um, in libraries. And so I wanted to mention that this program is available and if you're interested in learning more about how your library can partner, um, feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to connect with them. Thank you. So that, that was my, you know, my quick overview of the voting process and I will turn it back to Joy. Thank you for that presentation. We did have a question uh, in the meantime. Uh, people were asking, they wanna make sure that they can access all of the League of Women voters websites and access after today. Uh, I'm showing on the screen the LWV website and I'm going to show you another page which is I've set up a resources page uh, for this webinar that will have links to every resource that a presenter is talking about today. So uh, if you've been taking notes and opening uh, links in your web browser, that's fine. But you will also get access to all the information uh, that you can, that will be updated, presumably, I'm guessing <laughs> some things will get updated between now and the and the third as, as things change. So you will have, uh, the ability to access the LWV website very easily. So I think uh, unless anybody has any questions specifically for Eileen and I'm just checking. Ah, we have a question here. Let's see. For someone who just got married and changed their name, do they have to wait for their new ID to re-register to update their name or will the marriage certificate from the courthouse be enough? That's a great question. I am honestly going to pass that off to either Amy or Richard um, to answer because they are going to have a, a better answer than me. Okay, that's fine. Let's see. Okay, so um, our next panelist to present is Amy. And Amy, if you are ready and you want to turn on your microphone, I am going to show folks the Town of Little River website, and I need to introduce you actually. There we go. Amy Peterson is the director of the Lena Public Library, and she is also clerk for the Town of Little River. So she's pretty busy this time of year, as you might expect. I am going to switch to showing her communities website. So Amy, are you ready to go? I think I'm ready. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm glad our, ups, our Town of Little River website is up to date because everybody gets to see it now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm at the Lena Library, which is part of the Nicolay Federated Library System. We are about directly north of Green Bay, about a good 40 miles or so. So if you're wondering where we are in the state and actually the exit you take for Lena, if you go left, you go into Lena and go to the library. If you go right, you'll go towards the town of Little River. Um, so I'm serving in the municipality that I not only live in, but drive through every day to get to work. Um, so my task was to share with everyone how being the director at a small rural library and a clerk at a smaller municipality are the same. 
So for library directors of small libraries, we do it all. We work the CERC and the reference, reference desk because at small libraries, that's all the same desk. Uh, we are tech support, we are cataloging, we are children's and teens librarians, we are the groundskeeper, the light bulb changer, which I need to fire myself because we're a little behind here with that, uh, do payroll and budgets, clean the bathrooms, and of course respond to anything that's not right in the bathrooms, um, and that's just, you know, usually a Monday. Uh, my library office doesn't have a door, just a little alcove off of the front desk, um, so that I share that desk and um, office area with programming supplies, the hold shelf, the DVD cleaner, new books that are waiting to be entered, and of course the Friends of the Library candy bars back stock, which is never a good thing, especially during a pandemic and voting season. <laughs> Um, similar clerks from small municipalities also wear many hats besides voting. We also do budgets, which is similar to libraries, roads, property taxes, land use, zoning, building issues, reports to the state, garbage and recycling. We have ma maintained tractors, plow trucks, fire departments, and apply for grants, just like libraries do. So my clerk's office does have a door, but as you can see from the picture on the screen, our, uh, that the top building, I guess, with the little steeple on top, it's actually an over a hundred year old old schoolhouse is our town hall. So there's lots of building maintenance. It's very nostalgic or rustic or whatever the cool word is to say that it's very, very old. Um, so that's that, that one does have a door, but if you, the picture was a little bit bigger, you could see there's usually cows outside my window and on quiet days when the county road in front isn't too busy, I can hear the cows from that office. Um, the big difference for rural clerks compared to bigger municipalities is that we're all part-time employees. We're elected officials, um, but most of us are part-time employees, and I would want to say maybe not 100% of us, but a majority of us, this, the part-time clerk job isn't our main job. It's the job that we do on the side for a little extra money or because it's something that we're interested in. So with um, election season, it becomes another full-time job. So that's why clerks um, are doing things at different times of night um, and meeting people at different times because we don't have typical office hours because we're not there. We're usually at our other jobs. Um, and we don't have an extra staff to help when there's a big election. Um, we can hire people on, but sometimes you have to train them and that might take even more work than just doing it during yourself. And also there's more steps to that with training people and during a pandemic, that's also a little harder to try to get um, people into work or to train them to do things. Just like bigger projects around your library, there's a lot to get ready for each election. You have to get workers, you have to get them trained, you have to test your equipment, make sure you have all the supplies and that they're in place. And years where there are four elections, which is the year we're in now, we pretty much do not ever stop working on elections. As soon as one is done, we're already planning, ordering supplies, getting ready for the next election. So the presidential election years are high stakes enough for things, but in 2020, that really put it over the top for clerks. We already knew late last year this was going to be a busy year, but this really put it over the top with all the extra things we've had to do. And to put like some numbers in perspective, my first few elections in the town of Little River, um, I had five absentee ballot requests, like five, that's it. One indefinitely confined for people that just might've been out of town or had a doctor's appointment and they couldn't, you know, whatever that day that they couldn't um, be at the uh, polls. So um, this year I'm seeing numbers in similar to clerks around here, we're seeing numbers of 180, 200 absentee ballots um, for just um, elections that weren't um, like that in past years. Um, I think the best thing about clerks and librarians of all sizes is that we're good at sharing information and materials. Um, in April, when we had that huge surge of absentee voters, um, all of a sudden there was a lot of sharing absentee envelopes, sharing sanitizing supplies, even sharing workers to make sure that everybody had a new workers. A lot of us went from having Typical election workers are people that are retired, can work all day on a Tuesday. We went from having crews that didn't want to work anymore because they were in a high risk category. So my crew that worked in April had never worked an election before. So that was a different, um, not only training them and getting them ready, but not having anybody that had any experience with that. Um, so in O'Connell County, where my library is located, there are 29 municipalities and there's six libraries in our county. 
None of our libraries accept absentee ballot returns, um, mainly because we serve so many municipalities. Um, and another reason a lot of us are located, some couple, one of them is within, but are close to the village hall, we're there to have a drop off spot for those. So don't think because other libraries are necessarily a drop off spot for ballots that that's gonna, it's not something all libraries have to do. You have to look at, just like you do with everything else, look at it and decide if that's gonna work for your library, it's not gonna work for everybody. So that's one of the reasons we don't do it. Um, one of the things I do with my staff is the um, website that was just mentioned, the My Vote website. I wanna make sure that they're very familiar with that. Even we even use it throughout the year to make sure when people sign up for a library card, they're signing up in the right municipality because most people come in and they say, oh, I live in Lena. Okay, well, you could also live in six different townships when you have a Lena Wisconsin address. So we use it throughout the year to kind of just get them familiar with looking up somebody's address, seeing where they live. Because um, usually if you respond with, well, where do you pay your taxes? They still don't know. Oh, I send a check in. I don't know where it goes. Um, so if your staff can get really familiar with that, um, that would be a great thing to do. So that would be one of my top two suggestions for li librarians and their staffs right now is to make sure you're familiar with that website. The other one is to become friends with the clerks in your area. Um, and they need some grace right now. Just give them a little bit of time or a little bit of, <laughs> little bit of uh, maybe even tell them a joke once in a while. But if someone comes in the same you would do if somebody comes in and says, well, this, this the other library didn't do this the way I liked it. The same you would do with that of saying, well, maybe it caught them on an off day or this is the way it should have been done or let's look into that. Maybe there's an answer. The same thing with clerks. If somebody comes in and says, this is not going right or I don't know where my ballot is or something like that try to get the factual information and say, well, that doesn't seem quite right. Let's see, or let's get you in contact with the right person. Because 99.99% .99 of people are trying to do the right thing. They just need a little extra time and a little extra grace and a deep breath right now to figure everything out. So that would be my top two things is make sure your staff knows that website and two, they know who the clerks are to contact and that they've kind of got their back that they'll say, oh, that doesn't sound right. She's usually pretty quick about stuff. Um, let's give them a little, let's give her a call and see what's going on because we usually can answer the question or know um, what's going on. The other thing I'm supposed to share with everyone is a lot of the questions concerning um, that were submitted were about absentee voter and the steps that we go through when somebody requests an absentee ballot. So I wrote out, if someone contacts me for an absentee ballot, it's 12 steps that I have to go through to get them the ballot. So this is so if you want to know the behind the scenes, it's almost like cataloging a book. Like you think everybody thinks you just take, come it in and you put a you know sticker on the back and that's it. There's a lot more steps involved. So usually with voters, there's usually a phone call or an email and they ask how to vote absentee and there's a direction. So there's a pre-step almost that people call and I say, well, this is what you have to do. I can send you a form. You can go on this website. What do you want to do? Um, so there's always, sometimes there is a phone call if people can't figure that part out on their self on their own. Um, I receive an application via email, mail, or sometimes people drop it off in person. So nobody gets a ballot in the state of Wisconsin. Um, the fancy name is that they use is that they solicited it. Basically they asked for it. So nobody gets a ballot. We're not sending ballots to dead people or to anything like that. They have to ask for it. So nobody's just getting a ballot sent to them for no reason. Um, once I get that application, I check that the person is registered to vote. Mainly I do this when they're not doing it over email because then I know it's checked by the state but if they just sent in a form because the forms can come from all over I'm sure everybody has a few in their mailbox right now you get them from every anybody who's got a few million dollars to um, send and a few addresses they can send the applications out even though they come addressed to the clerk we don't send any out the state of Wisconsin sent some out here and I don't know if they've ever done that before. Um, so that was a legit one this year, but also there's ones from, we'll check your mailbox. You probably got eight sitting in there. Um, that I also check when those come in, I check if they're on the ineligible voter list. Um, I check my absentee log to make sure I haven't sent them a ballot already because with people getting applications from all kinds of organizations, sometimes they requested in April for the ballots to be sent to them for the entire year, but all of a sudden then somebody sends them an application so they think they have to fill it out again so they re almost reapply um, so that I have to check that. I check that everything is correct on their form and that their ID is correct and also that it's legible. So sometimes people take a picture of that ID and they email it to you and 
Um, you can't read it, so you have to ask them for another one. Um, so they have to get in contact with them. That can take a few minutes, it can take a day, or I have a few sitting on my desk that people are, I'm still waiting for them to get back to me. Um, if everything is correct, I send them a ballot. I get out two envelopes, one to send them the ballot in and one that they send everything back. For sending the envelope, I address it to them. You have to put two stamps on them um, so that it has enough postage. You have to put return address on them. For the envelope they send back to me, um, it has to have a stamp on it. So they, it shouldn't cost the voter a stamp to send everything back. Their, their um, return envelope is stamped. Um, they also, I have to initial it, write their name on it, um, make sure everything is um, correct. I also have to get a ballot, of course, in there. I have to initial that and fold that. I also send along a state of um, a sheet of instructions for filling out the ballot and the envelope, um, along with all of my contact information, along with all the state's contact information, if they have a trouble with that um, or don't know how to fill out their ballot or how to send it back. Um, then the enter, I enter the voter in the log in my absentee ballot log, their name, address, how I got their request, when I received their request, um, that I have a copy of their photo ID for what elections they requested the ballot for because you can request them for one election or the, for the full election year. I also enter what date I sent the ballot to them on and how I sent it to them. Right now we can only send them by mail, but previously in this year we could also email ballots out. Um, um, then I submit this log to the county. Um, we're, we're what's called the relier. We rely on our county to enter that information into WISVOTE, and that's how the My Vote information is entered. That you can see where your ballot is. You can look on there and see what date it was sent out uh, and when I got it back. So um, now that the person has their absentee ballot, the next step is they send it back to me um, via mail or drop off. If they come in the mail, I check that they have a postmark on them. Um, if they don't, I have to write on there th this, that they can, what, what the postmark should have been or like what it is when I got it. If they come in via drop off, I usually have to make an appointment to meet the person there to drop them off. And then I have to write on the envelope what date it was dropped off and I initial it. Um, we're due to the media coverage of absentee ballots right now, we're getting a lot more people that drop them off. And I can't, I'm not sure if that, I shouldn't say it's all media coverage, some of it's media coverage, and I'm sure it's also just the influx of a lot more ballots going out. Um, this is a little harder for rural clerks because we're not always in our office, so it's a lot more of meeting with people and things like that. Um, I checked the absentee envelope to make sure they signed it. It was signed by their witness and their witness has written their address on it. Um, I also make sure the envelope is sealed because if it goes in not sealed, um, it could be rejected by the election workers. So if there's a problem with any of these parts, I have to contact the voter and sometimes people come in, again, that could take a minute, it could take a day, it could take a week. So we assume that's all correct. Um, then I go back to my log and enter the dates the ballots was received back so that I have a record of um, how I got it back. Um, and that also gets entered into WISVOTE so that people can see it on myvote.gov. Um, there also, um, the, other, the other reason we submit to the county is that it's a second pair of eyes so that they can look and say, hey, you sent this person this, is this right? You also have to note on there if people are at, not at their home address and they want it sent to Tennessee because that's where they're vacationing right now or they send it to Arizona because they're already gonna be gone for the winter. Um, you have to note that all in your log. So it's not just Amy Peterson, I sent her a ballot everything I do with that ballot's noted. So once I have those ballots that are gonna be entered for that day, um, I put them in a locked ballot bag and that's sealed. And I have to verify that every time I go into that ballot bag, I have to log it and I have to say, this was the seal number. I broke the seal and put a new seal number on. Um, on election day, that log also is used again. Um, and we have to put on there if the ballot was counted or rejected, also the voter's number. And that all again, once I'm done with my log on election day, the log goes um, into WISVOTE so that people can see um, that they voted. Um, and if you go, you can even go look up yourself on the My Vote website and see, you know, on this date you voted, you know, in the village of Lena or wherever you lived at that time, it'll tell you where you voted. Um, absentee ballots are necessary. I know one of the questions was, do Kurtz do clerks hate absentee ballots? Absolutely not. Our job is to make sure anybody who wants to vote gets to vote. So we don't hate absentee ballots. It's a lot more steps as you can see, but it's not nothing, that's nothing we hate. Our thing is we want in a smooth election, election that nobody can 
question um, that we're as transparent as possible. So if you want to know what your clerk does when the ballots come back, some ballots go in a safe, some go in a ballot box, depending on your volume. Um, ours go in a bag and they get sealed. Um, so it just depends on your volume and what you're processing. But I, if you really have a question, I would ask your clerk in your local municipality because we, nobody wants election day to go smoother than us. If the end thing is that we're just tired at the end of the day and everybody got to vote who wanted to vote, that's a perfect day. Um, so ask a question, but assume that we're trying to 99% of the time do the right thing and let everybody vote who wants to vote, irregardless of how they choose to vote. So I think that's everything I have to cover, Joy. Well, Amy, does anybody have a question for Amy? You can click the Q&A icon in your Zoom toolbar if you do. And if you think of it later, that's fine. You can still uh, click the Q&A button and we'll make sure your question uh, is seen and answered. Thanks, Amy. So Chrissy, you are up next as our presenter. Are you ready to go? Got your mic unmuted? Yes, thank you. Cool. I'm gonna show everybody the uh, Madison Public Library website, and this will be a link on your resources page as well. Take it away, Christy. Thank you. So I am here today to um, share a little bit about what it's like um, to be a voting site and to do a lot of in-person absentee voting and how we started doing that at Madison Public Library. Um, so I'm Chrissy Wick. I'm the Assistant Director or Director of Public Services um, at Madison Public Library. Um, and in 2016, in early September, um, I got a text fairly late in the evening from our director who said, uh, we're at the Common Council meeting, uh, the city clerk and I are talking, what do you think about making libraries more active in voting? Do you think we can pull this off and do voting in libraries? Um, and normally, I, I would be a little more cautious about saying um, yes to a huge thing with very little training time and time to discuss logistics, but um, I knew that voting was really important to everybody um, on staff with us. And so I said, yes, I think we can figure this out. Um, and so uh, the Madison Common Council passed an ordinance that made all city offices a place where people could register to vote. Um, and where it could be a location for absentee voting. And so there were several locations across the city, all Madison Public Library locations, and then certain offices. Um, I think there was one like with the water utility, um, generally places that had staff in their offices during normal office hours, but were located far enough away from downtown um, that it couldn't just be taken on by the clerk's office. So um, we happened to have an all staff day just a week after this decision was made. And so uh, Mary Beth witzel -Beal, who is our wonderful city clerk, came and trained as many staff as she could. And then the rest of us uh, went out and trained other staff. It was a lot of train the, the trainer kinds of, of work um, so that I wanna say we started with the absentee voting at the end of September. I think back then um, we had a longer amount of time that we were able to do the in-person absentee voting. And so this was the single um, most well-received change in services I've ever seen in our library system. And I've been there 15 years now. Um, staff really, it was a lot of extra work that we were asking people do, to do, but they really embraced it. They really felt that it was rewarding. They really believed in making voting more accessible because our libraries were open till nine o'clock in the evening and we were open on Saturdays and some on Sundays. Um, and the stories that we got from people were amazing. A lot of people saying, I haven't been able to vote in 20 years because I have a health condition that makes um, voting on election day not always possible for me um, or they some people um, had literacy issues and they need they felt more comfortable having library staff read the ballot to them um, and some just felt libraries were more um, they felt more comfortable with the, the physical accessibility of a library 
Um, I think they felt pressure like waiting in a line on election day um, if they needed help, um, especially those that were in wheelchairs. And so we heard from, from those folks too that they really um, appreciated the extra access for voting. That being said, turnout was insane. So it was um, a presidential election. I would not recommend that being your first go around if, if your library is going to take on uh, voting. Um, and our library locations were the busiest voting locations in the city, even more so than the city clerk's office. Um, and it was a lot of communication with our clerk's office, like daily phone calls. She has what she, what she calls the bat phone, so that if people need help, they could, they could ask their questions directly to someone in the clerk's office. They had a courier system where they would drive to all of our libraries at the end of every night to collect the ballots. Um, and in Madison, there are a lot of different wards. So it was also really important to know all of the different wards that people might be in and make sure they were getting the right ballots. So there was a lot of double and triple checking of everything. Um, after that election, we had a lot of conversation with the clerk's office and we determined that really we, we were gonna need um, extra help. And so now the clerk's office provides their staff and they work out of our libraries to take on the voting during election seasons. Um, four years later, we're still the busiest absentee voting sites. Um, and we have worked a lot with the clerk's office to adapt to COVID. So um, when everything happened for the April election, you know, we had just shut down in March. We sent, we have 284 staff. Uh, we sent about 110 to the clerk's office to help process the absentee ballots. Um, we had a lot of our staff work on election day um, we still do have a lot of staff that we, um, you know, try to work ahead to make sure that we have adequate staffing in our buildings, but that we can also provide some staff to be election officials. Um, we uh, are now, as you can see from our website, helping with um, in-person absentee voting. So it happens um, at our library locations, but they're doing curbside voting. So it's tables set up outside of our locations and we're kind of just storing a lot of materials um, for the election officials. Some of our sites are voting sites for election day. And right now due to COVID, we've just said we're gonna close those libraries on election day um, because otherwise we won't be, we'll have too many people in the building. Um, we've also really learned, I, I think the key thing in all of this is being flexible and being responsive. Um, everything changes constantly. And I think that Eileen and Amy kind of alluded to this too, that you know, you know, an answer you might give at noon one day is different by five o'clock that same day. Um, and so we might have a plan worked out with the clerk's office that they're gonna do absentee voting on these days at these times. And then all of a sudden it turns out that, you know, a ruling has come down and now those dates don't work or we can do more dates or fewer dates. Um, so we just really try to be as flexible as possible. We try to be as transparent with staff as possible. Um, and we also try to remind our staff that we're dealing with election official officials whose jobs are also changing just like ours are, you know, day to day. So while we might think that they're expecting to do the job only curbside, some will show up and say, well, I thought it was going to be like a normal election. And then we have to, you know, do a lot of communication with the clerk's office about, well, what do you expect? What the election official expects something different. Um, and so there's a lot of connecting people, um, connecting staff with different resources, um, and then just answering questions from the public. And we've, we've had a lot of people um, still calling and just being really excited that they can still vote. Um, we had someone call the clerk's office uh, in April and he said, um, so you're telling me that I can vote at the Meadow Ridge Library? And she said, yes, you know, we've got locations all over the city. And he said, you know that Meadow Ridge serves a, a mostly black community, right? And we were like, yeah, we know that. And he said, so you're telling me you want me to vote? And, and was emotional and just like, felt so seen 
And so it's stories like that that really help reaffirm um, all of the work that we're doing and just that we really are making a difference for people um, in, in making voting accessible. So I think that that is, oh, one other thing I just wanted to add in too was that um, our clerk's office has been doing um, some equity analyses on voting in Madison. And so when we started in 2016, it was just kind of a, we do the same thing at all of our locations. And now they've really been looking at voter turnout and how it's different within different neighborhoods in Madison. And they're really putting an emphasis on making voting more accessible in the neighborhoods that have lower voter turnout, um, in neighborhoods that are, in Madison, we have what are called neighborhood resource teams. So neighborhoods that have been identified as the city as needing more resources. Um, we're really working to do more with those neighborhoods. We've also um, added voting, voter registration and in-person absentee voting to our Dream Bus sites which um, the Dream Bus goes specifically to those um, neighborhoods that have been identified by the city. Um, so we really are trying to make voting more equitable and using the tools that our, our city racial equity team has been building to make that happen. So that is all I had to say. We've got a lot of information on our website about what Madison is doing. Um, but again, that would be different depending on, on your relationship with the clerk's office and what your municipality decides can and can't happen within library spaces. Wow, thank you, Chrissy. That was amazing, all the things that you're doing at your public library. So glad to have heard uh, and seen everything that you're doing. And this website will be available as a link from the resources page that you will get after the webinar. And I am going to, I forgot to actually introduce you. I'm sorry, Chrissy, I'm glad you did. And so our next presenter, uh, we had uh, originally hoped that Megan would join us this morning as well, but she is uh, not available. Richard is going to be joining us, Richard Rydecki, who is the Assistant Administrator of the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Richard, are you, do you have your mic unmuted and are you ready to go? I'm ready. I can't, I can't wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for having us. We really appreciate the chance to present with, um, with all of you. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can provide some really good and useful information about what you guys can do uh, now at, at your libraries to assist voters in, in the run up to the November general election. And then also, you know, talk about some potential things that might re uh, require a little bit more coordination, a little bit more partnering, and, and a little bit more seasoning before uh, you could put those projects our programs into place. So first I want to thank Eileen, Amy, and, and, and Chrissy for their perspectives because uh, they provided just a, just a really great wide array of, of perspectives on the elections process, really great information about the basics. Amy laying out her 12-step uh, process for verifying a voter's identity and eligibility before issuing a ballot is amazing because uh, we get questions about the integrity of the process all the time and, and uh, do our best to try to articulate how many safeguards and checks there are, how many hands there are in the process, uh, so that, um, and how many eyeballs are on, on, on folks' information to make sure that, that everything, uh, that the, the process has integrity. And, and, and Chrissy, to, to walk us through, you know, everything that the city of Madison is doing to partner with their, with their um, library branches is, is amazing. And I think uh, not everyone's going to be able to get to that standard, and we understand that. But I think the, the goal here is uh, to figure out what, what you guys can do, what's reasonable, what, what's, what can you implement under uh, current circumstances with current uh, staffing and, and, and budget constraints. And I will say that um, as a City of Madison resident, I have taken advantage of the opportunity to vote uh, during the in-person absentee at numerous um, Mil uh, Madison library branches. Uh, uh, one both in my neighborhood and one that was just convenient for, for where I was on that day. And it is a really great service uh, for folks and to meet people where they are, uh, similar to how election day works where polling places are located within uh, neighborhoods, uh, having library branches open 
and it available for uh, for in person absentee voting or what folks call call early voting is is really just a great opportunity. Um, so first, I, I just want to kind of I think in my, my uh, role here, I think is basically tie up some loose ends. Everyone provided some really, really great information, starting with uh, Eileen uh, talking about deadlines and, and qualifications. Um, so I think, you know, just just to, uh, and, then, and then, you know, talking about the, the MyVote Wisconsin website. So, you know, we, we've worked with uh, a number of different, you know, library professionals over the years on on what uh, they can and can't do. And I think um, the oh, one of the really great roles that a librarian can play and, and they're there because they are a trusted source of information is is just understanding, you know, what the what the qualifications are for voting, what the deadlines are. Uh, and how folks can uh, find the forms and, and resources they need to accomplish things like registering to vote or requesting an absentee ballot. And um, Eileen touched on the voter registration deadline, which is fast approaching here, um, the, uh, open and, on, and online voter registration. Um, you know, in a future state kind of set, set up, you, you can potentially do what, what Chrissy talked about, is have your, have your librarians um, serve as, as election registration officials who, who can, actually assist people with registering to vote. Um, that can only happen during the open registration uh, period, which, which it's about to close. It closes the 20th day prior to election day. Uh, and then all, all registration has to happen either in the clerk's office or uh, at the polling place on election day. So um, if, if, you're, if your location isn't already designated as an in-person absentee voting site, you know, you're not gonna be able to do any sort of <clears throat> uh, assisting with uh, folks registering the vote after that October 14th close of, of registration. Up until then though, um, you can assist. You can help people fill out the form. You can help people uh, take a picture or, um, or make a copy of their proof of residence document. Uh, may, maybe your library location has public computers, which I know some of that is being restricted due to COVID-19 concerns or, or access to a printer. A lot of folks that we uh, speak with regularly don't have access to uh, the ability to print documents that they need and, and get those submitted to their clerk. So you, you guys can assist with that, uh, make copies, uh, give someone access to a printer, uh, and then figure out where the, where these documentation needs to be mailed to um, or delivered to. Finding the clerk's office uh, address is, is always a, something that, that, that can be helpful. The same thing goes for requesting an absentee, an absentee ballot. So a voter may come in, they may not know how to do that. Well, you can assist them with filling out the form. You can assist them with uh, making a copy of their photo ID that they may have to submit along with their requests if they don't already have one on file. Um, all those requests uh, in Wisconsin need to be submitted to the municipal clerk by October 29th. And we know that deadline is very close to election day and it's, it's dangerous, I would say, uh, to submit an absentee ballot request um, that close to election day. Uh, if you think, if you think about uh, from this perspective that uh, each ballot has to be mailed out to the voter and then they have to have time to vote that ballot and return it. If they're return, trying to return it via the postal service, then you have, you know, postal service transaction on both sides of the equation there. And it's going to be really hard if you, if you request the ballot on the 29th to receive it, vote it and get it back in time to be counted. So, um, so working with voters and making sure that they understand that, you know, the deadline is, is flexible and, and pretty late in the process, but the sooner they get that, that request in, uh, the better off they're gonna be. The sooner clerks like Amy, who are working diligently, uh, uh, sometimes around the clock, literally, uh, to, to process an honor absentee request can get that ballot in the mail so the voter can receive it. And then they can figure out what, what their options are for returning the ballot so that it's, it's delivered by APM on election day and, and, and time to be counted. Um, uh, as Eileen talked about, the MyVote Wisconsin website is an amazing resource for, for folks to get information about, um, about voting. And if you want to click on, on that link there, I think we'll, it'll take us right to the, the MyVote site. And um, uh, a lot of folks are already familiar with the website. They know that folks can use it to find their polling place or they can view their sample ballots so they're prepared ahead of, day, uh, ahead of time for, for voting on election day. Uh, but there's been some new features that have been that have drawn a lot of attention in, in 2020 due to uh, COVID related concerns. So um, uh, you see there's two buttons there. One of them says vote absentee and the other one uh, says track my ballot. Um, and folks can submit their their absentee ballot request via the MyVote system. 
Uh, it will prompt them to upload a copy of their photo ID uh, if they are required to submit one and they don't ha already have one on file. If they do already have one on file with their clerk, they'll be able to they'll make a clean transaction, submit that copy of their photo ID along with their request, and that'll go right directly to the municipal clerk, who all they have to do is just verify that information like Amy talked about earlier, and then get that ballot out in the mail. Um, some of the new things that we've worked on since the April election is giving people tools to better track their ballot. So we added this new track my ballot button and built out some of the ballot tracking features. So you may get some people that come into the library saying, hey, I don't know what's going on with my ballot. I requested it and, um, and can you help me figure that out? Well, uh, if you click on the track my ballot button, it's gonna ask for the voter to search uh, for themselves using their name and their date of birth. And once they, uh, once they find themselves, they're gonna be able to view their absentee request uh, and see where it is in the process. And they're gonna be able to see when the clerk received the request, uh, when they pr started preparing the ballot, when that ballot hit the mail stream, uh, uh, and if that ballot has been scanned by the postal equipment, when that voter should expect that ballot to be delivered to their home. And then on the back end, they'll be able to, when they mail or, or hand deliver their ballot back to their clerk, they'll be able to see that it was uh, accepted by the clerk and logged into our system. In addition, <clears throat> if they return their ballot and there was a problem with the envelope, meaning they forgot to include one of the three required pieces of information, either the voter signature, the witness signature, or that witness address, that, that tracking status bar will actually have a, uh, uh, the final square will be, will be lit up in orange. And that will alert the voter that they need to contact their clerk because there's, there's potentially a problem with their ballot that will lead to that ballot not being counted. So the best thing to do is contact the clerk directly as quickly as possible so that you can remedy that problem. And as you can see, there are some uh, features for finding the location of a municipal clerk that, um, that Joy, I believe, is highlighting for us. And, uh, and you can, that's an address-based search where you can, you can uh, put in a voter's address and it'll identify which clerk is actually theirs. As Amy talked about, some of our voters aren't quite sure which uh, municipality they reside in for voting purposes. So there's often a lot of confusion between someone's mailing address and their municipal address. Maybe not, um, uh, uh, maybe not so much uh, concern in, in bigger cities, but definitely in uh, some small, smaller townships where they, their mail may go to, uh, you know, the city of Eau Claire, but they actually live in a smaller township out, outside of uh, that jurisdiction. So those are some really great tools uh, that that um, have been uh, kind of built into the MyVote uh, website and uh, have been have been highlighted and, and uh, we made some updates to that to better meet people's expectations since the April election. Another thing that we're doing now, uh, and this may be of use for you guys when helping a voter, uh, helping voter find information that helps them participate is we have now uh, included in-person absentee or early voting information on the MyVote website and also Dropbox location. So, um, if a voter is wondering where they can, uh, where they can uh, uh, either vote early, uh, maybe even at your, uh, maybe even at one of your library branches, uh, or or where to drop a ballot, and once again, maybe even at one of your library about uh, 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 branches, uh, that information is uh, is searchable. Um, you, you can find it via the track my ballot feature. is the easy way to is the easy way to do that, where the voter would look themselves up, and then they're going to get a button that says view my local absentee options. Once they click on that, um, they will see they'll be able to see those Dropbox and, and in person absentee voting locations for that. Um, for that jurisdiction. So that's a really great resource that we uh, built into the system just and launched recently. It's, it's new. Um, so uh, if, if you are working with a voter on, on, uh, on uh, those types of things, um, you know, then, then that might be a helpful search to use. Um, and I don't wanna take up too much of, of your time, but I think a lot of the things that Chrissy talked about, they do require some time to develop these partnerships. So as of right now, if you were interested in your, in your library becoming an in-person absentee voting site, you wouldn't be able to do that for the November election. All those sites had to be designated by the governing body in, in which that library branch uh, um, exists prior uh, to the actually the August election. So by June 11th, all those sites had to be designated. So if that's something that you're interested in pursuing, you know, that would have to be a, you know, that's more of a 2021 project or a moving forward project. 
um, uh, we, we do think that it's a great opportunity for folks to, to have more community-based in-person absentee sites, uh, but uh, you know you, you have to uh, do so according to the statutory guidelines and, and that opportunity is not available right now. Um, so I think those are those are the basics. I know we're, we're, we're at 10 o'clock here and I didn't know if we wanted to uh, save enough time for questions, uh, but uh, so I'd be happy to ta take any questions that folks have or go into details on any more um, information that, that we presented on and also maybe answer that, um, that marriage license question that we had earlier in the presentation. Well, and you're fine to continue, Richard. We built in uh, an extra half hour. We can stay on till 1030 to make sure that folks' questions get answered. So the marriage question, indeed, and we did get uh, another question in. Uh, let's see, I think Richard needs to reiterate what he said about when librarians can assist and when they cannot and need to redirect them to the clerks. Sure. Okay. So I think um, there are some really great opportunities for folks to be able to assist, right? Um, uh, but in the end, you know, the local election official is the one that has to, you know, is, is the one that processes the, the information. So um, if, if a voter comes in and needs help with filling out a voter registration application uh, or getting a copy made of a, a proof of residence document or, or a photo ID for an absentee request, by all means, you can, you can assist with that. Um, you can provide them with the form. You can point them to the My Vote Wisconsin website. You can walk them through the steps needed to complete that process. You can give them access to a printer. Um, for folks that can't register online uh, because they don't qualify uh, to use the online voter registration system, they can still use My Vote to fill out the form. It's gonna give them a, a legible, printable, uh, complete form with all the required information. They're just gonna have to print it and deliver it to the clerk's office. So you can help folks do that. Uh, if you're helping someone fill out one of those forms uh, due to a, a uh, for reason of disability, well, then there's an assister section that that you can uh, fill out and sign, so that <clears throat> um, so that uh, the the clerk understands that the voter was provided assistance while filling out the form. Um, what you can't do is you know sign off on proof of residence documents and and collect voter registration applications and submit them to the clerk. You know as as you may have been able to do in the past, as, as there was the ability for a role in, in, uh, provided by state law called the special registration deputy. That, that role has been removed. Um, so any applications that you're helping with um, and any proof of residence documents you're helping making copies of, you can actually still help the voter by mailing those into the clerk if they need access to an envelope or a stamp or some service that you're able to provide. Um, but you, you're doing so on behalf of the voter. You're not doing so as an election official. Uh, the same thing with absentee requests. If someone says, I don't have a printer, I don't have a way to make a copy of my photo ID, you can help uh, collect that information and provide that uh, directly to the clerk. Um, but you're doing so as, as uh, assistance to the voter and not as an election official. So um, those, are, those are things that you can do. When it comes to witnessing an absentee ballot, um, if that's something you're willing to do uh, in your role as either a private uh, citizen or in your professional role as a, as a, li a librarian or a library uh, staff person, uh, you can actually do that. Uh, um, it's up to you to decide though, if that's a role that you're, you're willing to play. In uh, many instances, so what the law, well, let, let's just uh, think about what the law requires here as a witness. So the law requires a witness to be uh, a US citizen for, for the vast majority of voters and at least 18 years of age, right? So that's a pretty flexible standard. Um, but the witness also has to observe the, the voter, um, uh, start with an unvoted ballot, and then the, the voter should vote the ballot in the presence of, of the witness. Now that doesn't mean the witness uh, should see who the, uh, the voter cast their ballot for, who, which, which circles uh, they filled in, which person they wrote in as a candidate, which uh, arrows they completed, uh, depending on the type of ballot they use. Uh, but they should be the one confirming that, hey, this person started out with a blank ballot and they were the, actually the one who, who voted that ballot and placed it in the envelope. Once all that's been done, the witness uh, can place their signature and their 
uh, address on the on the envelope as as the voters witness and then the voter can submit that ballot um, either via Dropbox or, or mail it back to to the clerk for for processing so that that is allowed um, but it's uh, should you witness a ballot where a voter comes in and they've already voted it and sealed it in the envelope I would say you should not because you're not going to be able to meet your statutory duty in that regard and, and confirming that the voter started with with a blank ballot in that situation it may be frustrating um, to the voter or even to you in, in that situation but we need to make sure that you know folks understand the requirements for for the witness and are, and are kind of following these procedures to the, to the letter of the law otherwise we're putting folks ballots at risk for for, for not being counted for uh, uh, not following the you know the required administrative procedures um, so I think those are those are um, some basics I hope that helped answer your questions please let me know in the in the chat or the Q&A if if you guys need more clarification on that thank you Richard um, oh continue <laughs> I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to mention a question that um, was asked ahead of time that I don't think was covered yet today. And I believe on the WEC website, um, there's information. I'm going to uh, pull that page up. It's regarding disruptions at, you know, if your library is a polling place. And I think this would be um, a small member of, of libraries that are polling places, but there um, is information on the WEC page about um, if uh, someone is doing poll watching or, uh, or preventing people from voting. There is information on the WEC website. Yeah, so I, that's a great point. And I think that's, this is really timely, um, uh, a timely topic for people that are that are concerned about, you know, uh, you know, some of the kind of rumors out, out there, just just generally the the volume and conduct of election observers. So we're actually working on two pieces of, of guidance right now for our, our, our poll workers and our clerks. Um, one is just an update on our obser observer guidance uh, that we're going to be putting out hopefully today or, or tomorrow. And then we're also working on some physical security rec recommendations for um, for clerks can, to consider uh, working with their local law enforcement on uh, when it comes to the potential for, for um, you know, gatherings outside of a polling place or early voting location uh, or even a, 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 a ballot counting location if, it, if a municipality uh, counts their absentee ballots using what's called the central count facility. Um, so in Wisconsin, anyone that wants to uh, can serve as an observer uh, at any polling place or ballot counting location, provided they're not a candidate on the ballot for that election. Um, all they have to do is come into the polling place, uh, let the chief election inspector know that they're there to observe. They'll have to sign in on the observer log and, and, and show some form of ID. Uh, they should wear an observer badge that's provided to them by the election workers, and they should uh, be, uh, uh, they should stay within the designated observation er area. And each polling place should have one of those identified. Um, a lot of folks will mark those off on the floor with tape so that they um, they understand exactly, the observer understands exactly the area that they should, should be in. And state law requires that observation area to be within three to eight feet of, you know, the poll book table and the voter registration table, we'll say, for, for to simplify that. And um, for COVID, you know, 19 related concerns, you know, we're obviously stressing that those observation areas should be located closer to that eight foot range within that six to eight foot range, uh, if possible, to keep people separated. Um, while observers are allowed to be present in, in the polling place, they shouldn't cause a, a, any dis, a disturbances or interfere with the orderly processing of voters on election day or the counting of ballots. Um, so they can be there, they can ask questions, uh, they can make sure that procedures are being followed uh, according to the letter of the law, but they shouldn't be um, initiating any contact with voters. Uh, they can't issue any, cha uh, uh, any challenges of ballots outside of what's uh, allowed in, in the law. Uh, and, and they should, uh, you know, they shouldn't be making uh, phone calls or, or things like that. Anything that's going to cause a disruption, disruption. They're not allowed to handle, you know, original election uh, related documents such as proof of residence documents that voters are using to register to vote or are voted ballots. Um, that's not something that they're allowed to do as an election observer. So if they are causing a disturbance, 
Uh, the chief inspector, uh, the chief election inspector, who's there's one of those required to be at each of our uh, polling places across Wisconsin on election day, should should first try to work with that observer to under, to let them know, hey, what you're doing is not okay. Uh, we have a job here to do today to do today, and it involves you know making sure that all of our voters have an opportunity to participate in in the election. Now, if if the observer does not change their behavior and continues to cause a disturbance, that's when the uh, the chief inspector should should um, work on getting that observer removed from that location. And it may sound like a, a, a drastic option. It doesn't happen a lot, but uh, it is necessary. And sometimes when an observer just will not uh, follow the rules and is, it is actively trying to um, uh, <clears throat> you know, just, uh, cause, a, cause a disruption in the, in the processing of voters. And in those cases, it may be easiest to work with lo local law enforcement to assist with uh, that removal if that person will not uh, you know, go quietly and remove themselves from the situation. In those cases, I would suggest giving us a call at the Elections Commission. We're going to be staffed from 6 a.m. on Election Day until uh, well into the following morning. Um, and we can, we can help uh, walk folks through uh, that situation situation. Um, so hopefully the no one has to kind of uh, triage these types of issues. But you know, in, in these cases, law enforcement might be uh, a really helpful resource to, to help uh, remove a, an unruly observer. Thank you, Richard. And you brought up a good point that I forgot to mention is that both the WEC and uh, well, the WEC has a toll free number that people can call, a librarian can call, um, a librarian can refer a patron to call the toll-free number with questions. And yep. uh, cool. I would um, say for election day, if you have kind of an observer related question that 608-261-2028 uh, um, number uh, for that we have designated for election official assistance is a really, is a, is a better resource. Um, we actually are working with uh, a call center right now to help us manage our call volume when it comes to voter related calls and those those calls are going through um, that 1866 number and uh, you, you can still get you can still uh, end up being in contact with a WEC staff person if you use that number um, but it's a lot quicker and one less handoff uh, required if you use that 2028 um, number and then gives a call directly on that line. Great thank you. I'm going to also mention on the League of Women Voters website, um, there is a number to call. Let's see, that's for my vote. League of Women's, uh, here we go. There's a voter helpline that they have set up, a nonpartisan voter helpline that you can call for help as well. And we have about 15 minutes left where we can stay on till 1030. Um, any other panelists, do you want to um, answer any unanswered questions or have anything to add? Richard, what's the answer to the marriage license question? Because <laughs> now that I don't know the answer, it's bugging me and I'm sure somebody will bring one in. <laughs> right. So in this case, it's a little tricky for the voters. So they may have to decide what they want to do. Um, because if you think about it, so there's two, there's two standards that the voters going to have to meet here. The first is they're going to have to re-register to vote and their proof of residence document needs to list their current name and current address on it, right? So that marriage license that they get um, might, might meet that standard. I'm not quite sure if a marriage license would actually list the current address. Um, our county clerks, if there was anyone from that population on this call, might be able to answer that a little bit better than I can. Um, but uh, so they're gonna need a proof of residence document that's from the approved list that lists their current name and current address. And that just gets them registered. So on top of that, they're gonna actually gonna need to provide a photo ID uh, from their approved list, meaning a driver license or state ID card or a passport, uh, military ID, you know, something from the, the eight or so um, uh, acceptable IDs for voting purposes that the legislature has, has provided for in, in, in state law and show that in order to receive a ballot. So in the, these cases, if they, uh, they may be, it may be beneficial for someone to wait on updating their, their voter registration until after they get all of their documentation together and filed with the various government entities that need, uh, that, need that information. So, because if you change your name on your voter registration and then you have a uh, driver license or a state ID card and uh, your name doesn't necessarily conform 
uh, uh, your voter register, your name that you're registered under to vote doesn't conform with the name on the ID, you're going to have a hard time getting a ballot. And um, uh, this, this can be a little tricky when it comes to hyphenated names. And whenever uh, we get questions on this, we would say that as long as the name conforms on, on one side or either side of the hyphen, then you're okay. So uh, if you, uh, you know, if you, um, if you're, uh, you, you, get, uh, you get married and you decide to change your name or you go with a hyphenated name. And then and if I were to say, for example, take on, take on uh, my spouse's last name, I would be Richard uh, Radecki dash Reich, right? So if I were, if, and if my, I didn't get my driver license updated, so it still said Richard Radecki on it, and I was registered with that hyphen, um, I would still be able to use that because my, we feel like the name conforms enough. Uh, that's what statute says in, the, in, in regards to verifying the name on the ID is that the name should conform uh, to the name on the ID should co conform to the voter's registered name. Um, so in that case, you know, either side of the hyphen is going to work. Um, but if, if I changed my name to Richard Reich and my driver license said Richard Radecki, well, then I'm out of luck because that name is not going to conform. Um, so there may be, you know, situations where someone wants to, <clears throat> to delay getting their voter registration updated until they get that documentation or in order if that makes sense to everyone. Another one of the questions was, and I know the answer to this one, I'm pretty sure, um, is if somebody gets an absentee ballot in the mail, they can still vote on election day. And the answer is yes, you can bring it in and vote that actual ballot or bring it in, you know, already with your witness and it just has to be in by eight o'clock on election day for now <laughs> until we get, an, if we get another decision. But if you're going to hold on to your ballot and you're from a rural community, let your clerk know you're going to vote on that day because it'll probably save her a little headache and a phone call thinking that, you know, it didn't get back or something like that. So I already have a couple of people that have called in and said, hey, we decided we're going to vote on election day. What do you want us to do with their ballot? Um, bring it with you because then I, it's one less ballot I have to account for, but you can still right. vote in person even if you get an absentee. Right. The key is, though, you cannot vote in person if you have returned that absentee ballot. So yes. the act of yep. returning that ballot is what locks people into that ballot and, and doesn't allow for them to cast a, another ballot on election. Mm -hmm. um, and that's there's a little bit confusing for some folks because people that have been working in elections for a while know that up until 10 years ago, you could actually do that. You could do what, what folks called beat your ballot to the polls. Meaning if you voted absentee by mail and changed your mind, you could try to show up to the polls on election day and, and have them pull your ballot before that absentee ballot was processed and then you could vote a new one. Uh, you can no longer do that. Statute is very clear that if you have returned your absentee ballot, then you you're not eligible to receive a, a, another ballot on election day at the polling place. That being said, if you have returned your, your ballot, you can actually contact your clerk and ask them to do what is called spoil your ballot. Basically, they're going to invalidate your ballot and uh, it'll be like you never returned that ballot and you'll still be eligible to vote on, on election day. So it's a little bit complicated, but just because you've returned your ballot doesn't necessarily mean you, you're locked out. But after um, you do need to make those, those requests to spoil the ballot by that October 29th um, deadline for requesting an absentee ballot. Um, but if you, if you have been issued an absentee ballot and you haven't voted it and you've changed your mind, you wanna vote in person, uh, you, you're just like Amy said, you can just show up at the polling place on election day. They're gonna, they're, you're, the poll worker should ask you, there's gonna be a notation next to your name uh, that says you've been issued an absentee ballot and they're gonna ask you if you've returned it. And if you say no, then you should get, a, you'll, they should issue you uh, an, an absentee ballot. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a regular ballot at the polling place and you can vote that. Thank you. We got a new question in from an attendee. Are there any cases or decisions pending on specific voting issues that we should be on the lookout for? So this is Wisconsin. So the answer is yes. It's always yes. There's always <laughs> pending litigation um, going on with, with elections here. We, uh, 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 we recently had a, an appellate court decision that was that was issued that we've been waiting for for uh, almost four years. Um, so that's how long some things take uh, take to work through the system. Um, but I, I think in the forward facing, when it comes to November 3rd, there's one case out there that is really kind of, it's still in the appeals process. And, it, and if there's a decision prior to election day would really, uh, would really impact how the rules that are used for conducting this election. 
Um, internally, we call this the DNC case. I don't really know. It's a consolidate. It's like four or five different cases that have been consolidated into one. Um, it's essentially a, a federal judge, Judge Connolly, ruled a couple of weeks ago that uh, he felt, uh, due to COVID-19 related concerns, that certain deadlines should be extended. Um, so, for example, uh, the voter registration deadline that Eileen touched on a little bit earlier should be extended uh, uh, one week until October 21st for by mail and online voter registration. Uh, he also said that absentee ballots uh, it could be counted if they are postmarked by Election Day and returned up until November 9th. Uh, he also suspended the, um, the, the requirement that uh, poll workers reside within the county in which they want to serve on election day. And then he also uh, established a, a, an electronic uh, ballot replacement um, opportunity, a one week window for voters who have requested an absentee ballot by mail, haven't received that, they could receive a replacement ballot by, by fax or email. Um, so all those, all those changes, there's a, there's a few more kind of uh, smaller nuts and bolts decision or changes that he ordered too as part of his decision. But that, that decision is currently under appeal uh, with the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and it has that decision has been stayed. Um, and so, which which essentially in, in non-legal terms means the, the decision that Judge Connolly made, all those changes that he ordered are not in effect. What is in effect are all the rules that are can that are that are uh, still on the books in Wisconsin law, meaning, you know, open voter registration closes 20, the 20th day before the election. So that's October 14th. It's coming up later this week. Um, SD ballots, uh, in order to be counted, have to be received by 8 p.m. on election day. Um, you know, if you're wanting to work as a poll worker, you're going to be restricted to working as a, a poll worker uh, in, in the, the county in which you reside. Um, and uh, there's no uh, opportunity for clerks to send out ballots electronically to, to any voter except for uh, military and overseas voters. That's the only carve out in statute that currently exists for electronic ballot delivery. So that's the one big case that we're still out there monitoring. Uh, we don't necessarily know if we're going to hear an answer on that appeal prior to election day or, or, or not. Um, we're hoping that if we do hear a, a decision on this, we hear it soon because uh, obviously there still is the ability for, for um, folks to appeal this decision uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court, which um, you know, prior to 2020, which sounds unlikely, but we, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court did weigh in on, on a postmark requirement ahead of the April election on the night before, or really close to, uh, before the election, causing you know additional confusion. So there is there are some machinations that are still possible. Right now, we're we're working under you know current statutory guidelines for all of these things because Judge Connolly's decision is on hold, and we cannot implement any of the changes that he ordered. This is Eileen. Um, I would just add the League of Women Voters is watching this really closely too. And so we will be updating our resources um, to reflect any changes as well. So um, feel free to keep that in mind, I guess, as you're sharing our resources with people. So both the League of Women Voters website and the WEC website would be good places for people to go to keep up to date on these changes? Yes. Um, any changes that will be reflected in both our agency website, so you, you showed it earlier, elections.wi.gov, and then also we would build in uh, that information into the deadlines we have in, on the MyVote Wisconsin website. Great, thank you. We have about five minutes left and there was one question, actually uh, a question, we have a variation on it and Chrissy or um, uh, Amy, maybe you would be folks to answer. Um, what can library staff do to remain neutral? This is basically when working with patrons and how to handle questions that turn political, like who are you voting for? So do you have any advice for phrases? Our staff are, are pretty well trained to just be really upfront to say, you know, I, I can't talk about that sort of thing while I'm at work. Um, because it's not only is it, you know, part of being an election site, but it's also part of our city's um, code of conduct that we, um, don't discuss that with patrons. 
Got it. Thank you. So we have a couple minutes left. Oh, and, and uh, anyone else want to uh, reply as well? Yeah, Jory, I know you didn't ask uh, me, but... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Eileen. <laughs> didn't mean to leave you out. <laughs> no, no, fine. But I just thought I'd share um, an answer because we, as a nonpartisan organization working um, in the voter education space, we do get that question um, fairly often. And, you know, we don't endorse any candidates or parties, but what we try to do um, is pivot to resources that people can use to make their own informed decisions. So it's like, I'm not going to tell you uh, who to vote for, but if you're looking for information, you can go to vote411.org and, and um, learn about the candidates there or, you know, read stuff in the newspaper or different. You can point people to resources so they can make their own decision. Great. Vote411.org. Okay, very good. Thank you. Well, we have just a couple of minutes left. Anybody else want to um, give any more information while we are available? Any more questions from the attendees? If not, I can follow up. Oops. oops. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I was doing really well. Um, let's see if I can share that slide. There we go. So as a follow up to the webinar today, uh, you will tomorrow receive an email that will have a, uh, a link to today's webinars resources page and Lori also shared it in the chat for you. There will be links to the websites mentioned today, also a CE activity report form if you need one, and there will be a link to the evaluation form. And when you exit the webinar today, you will also have an opportunity to uh, fill out the evaluation form at that point. So I believe that is everything. I want to thank all of our panelists today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to uh, to meet with us. And I see one chat message, so I'm just going to make sure I'm not missing something. Okay. Um, uh, so yes, thank you again to all of our panelists and to our co-hosts. And thank you all of you who attended the webinar for taking the time out of your day. So I think with that, I will wish you all a good week and say goodbye. Thanks everybody. Appreciate you guys having us. Oh, glad you could make it, Richard. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Bye. <laughs>